Things are true for phenomenologists because they reflect the situation the observer thinks they see. But because we see water gushing over a dam, we cannot project this rate of flow backwards. Perhaps a few hours ago the flow was just a trickle through a crack in the masonry, which then gave way. There are personal or subjective truths that refer to a person's state of being. I am hungry and I like pizza, are statements about my physical state or my awareness. The paint is red, and it is raining are factual statements, meaning the claim can be agreed to by observation or rejected with an explanation. But facts are contingent on time and place of event and observer. The car will start if the battery is charged and the tank contains gas, is a contingent truth. Contingent truths rely on observation and are specific to the conditions referred to. Implicit in this claim is the fact that if it is out of gas or the battery flat, the car will not start. There are a lot of people who believe God exists and a great many others who think the claim, doubtful. Others think the political left is a better party than the political right. Others think the opposite. Everyone thinks they have the truth, but they cannot convince anyone who believes differently, they are wrong. Yet, people switch sides all of the time. What truth is it that has no greater power than the lie it purports to correct? The question must be asked, what truth is, that has no substance? If conservatism is obviously better than socialism, why is there no logical proof of it? What is a truth that cannot be substantiated? There are three sources of truth, logic, the Bible and observation. The latter is the basis of empiricism. Yet, few participants in a debates remember that even if one position may be right and the other may be wrong, and know it is not possible for both parties to be right, the fact remains that two opposing arguments might be wrong. If neither side can convince the other and if both sides cannot be right, it seems the probability lies with them both being wrong. It is not that one argument or set of arguments is not better than the other. It is that better in this case depends on subjective criteria. The response to the alternative hinges on which set of values you think best. The right favors self-reliance and freedom from government, the left prefers social responsibility and freedom from the vagaries of the free market. To simplify these choices, we can say the right favors the rich and the left favors the poor. Is there a way to empirically prove one group ought to be favored over the other? Is one group more deserving than the other? Observation proves a person picks the side that represents his or her values and changes sides as their values change. But if we are one of the few that denies either group is more blessed than the other, then we ought to question if a system that requires us to preference one group more than another has any intrinsic merit? Perhaps neither group has any special merit and if not then the system they are part of may lack merit. The right might say the rich have more merit because they provide capital and innovation. But the left argues, because someone is poor does not mean they lack rights or exist to serve the aspirations of the wealthy. But if the system preferences those with wealth, the poor have few choices but to cater to those who have the wealth. This means people who have wealth also have power. If the society prefers socialism or leans toward socialism, the rich will have a social agenda forced on them, meaning they will be required to fund social programs. The answers and responses are different and often mirror images, that does not make one option better than the other, unless one has a biased perspective. Philosophers would say that the responses to the left and right arguments are subjective. There is no objective reason to choose the left over the right, or vice versa. Yet, that being said, we seem forced to choose. This is the dilemma of democracy. We have to choose regardless of how bad the options are. We can vote for a candidate based on inadequate and possibly fictitious criteria or we can allow others to make the choice for us. But if the candidate is not the one you prefer, you lose the right to complain about the outcome by not voting. Adults are forced to make choices even when there are inadequate facts. 
this may appear to be a flaw in the fabric of reality. The fact that we can be forced to choose when there are no criteria to make a choice on, would make it seem as if the world is a chaotic and ungoverned place. But this is not the case. It does not matter about the answer if the consequences are substantially the same. Only moral questions matter because only moral questions have substantial consequences. A moral question is grounded in the epistemology of right and wrong. It is neither right nor wrong to support the political left or the political right because it not moral to rob Peter to benefit Paul, whoever Peter and Paul is. We cannot turn moral issues into ethical precepts. It is not moral to hurt one to save another though it might be legal and ethical. A moral truth is a necessary truth. Philosophers may think ethical precepts can serve as moral principles but there is a world of difference between, thou shalt not kill, which is an ethical command and a moral principle or necessary truth. Ethical commands can be imposed on others. Moral precepts are applied to oneself. God exists is an axiom or imperative proposition. Some prefer to refer to it as the God hypothesis. Regardless it is a proposition that leads to deductions. If God exists he must exist as the highest and most perfect thing which can be conceived, otherwise he would not fulfill the conditions of what it means to be God. God would not create anything greater than himself nor could anything greater than an absolute, exist. This class of things that are less than God, includes logic. We can create logical paradoxes about God only if our logic is higher and more sublime than God. The judging of God is a logical error, for logically nothing can be higher than God. We do not create a logical paradox when fashioning contradictions about God, we are creating logical fallacies. Nothing is greater than God and that includes logic. But this truth means God is more than a necessary truth as he is beyond the qualifications of truth. Necessary truth can be derived from the perfection of God. Necessary truth is not greater than God and it does not produce a belief in God. Belief in God does lead to the realization of necessary truth. To comprehend the idea of necessary truth we have to understand the absoluteness of God. There is no qualifications to God. His absoluteness is absolute. He created all things means there is no existence possible without his word. Yet, God created all things is not a necessary truth because it is an absolute of God. If God exists, then creation is an absolute. The same goes for all of the attributes of God. They are, as God Island. To comprehend the absoluteness of God and His creation is to understand God owes us nothing and we have nothing to give to God. Faced with this fact we realize we are faced with a choice. The essential fact of this choice is that God exists and everything that exists was created by God for His purpose and His pleasure. God is sufficient unto Himself. Unless we comprehend the absolute completeness of God, we cannot understand the choices we have. We cannot do anything for God. But if we understand this in its absoluteness, we know we can do something for ourselves or for others. And that is the choice. God did not create us to be Him. As humans we are made in His image, but not of His substance. We do not exist for our own purpose but for Him who made us. If we live for our own purpose, we take the high seat. What is more, we claim what is not ours. In other words, we freeload. To freeload is to be of the substance of God because those that would freeload are self-justified. The necessary truth that cannot be refuted and which must be true, is the moral principle that forbids all freeloading. We are not sufficient to be justified by our own agency. If we do not freeload, we live for God through the agency of our own kind. Works of faith are works done in faith. These are works done, not in a particular emotional state or by means of psychokinesis, but in the church as built from the spirit of those who live in faith. Without faith we must inevitably freeload. 
this is a logical necessity or a logical necessary outcome of living in a state of fear. But just as we could not fully understand the nature of a necessary truth without understanding the nature of God, we fail to understand the moral nature of the necessary truth if we do not understand faith. Moral truths have consequences. The consequence of choosing immorally is that one becomes a freeloader. Do not freeload is a moral truth which in another sense only means we have to make positive moral choices. But to begin to understand what this means, we must understand what is meant when God talks about His church. The church is the manifestation of God on earth. When we freeload, we harm the church because we harm those who are making moral choices. When we freeload, we act in fear of others, not faith. To not freeload is not about the specifics of taking something without compensating the seller. Stopping freeloading is about eliminating the mechanics behind freeloading. Freeloading is an act of hate based in fear and is antithetical to faith. If we live in faith, we reject the politics of fear. Those who live in faith trust and can be trusted. We work from a position of trust, not of fear. But trust cannot survive in an environment of fear and freeloading is the manifestation of fear, which is why it must be discontinued in a faithful church. The destructiveness of fear is why it is vital we build the church. Most people think that the church is just a lecture hall for Christians, but it is better considered a social system that opposes the politics of freeloading and fear. The politics of fear require steep administrative gradients and power disparities. Freeloading erodes faith and trust. One does not have faith in an environment that tolerates freeloading. This is why freeloading is antithetical to Christianity. If we as Christians exploit our fellow believers, we cannot claim we have faith. Faith in God translates into faith in the believers of God. There is nothing mystical about why the law cannot save us. The law replaces faith. Law is not needed where faith exists. The rule of law is conversely, evidence that those under the law lack faith. If we choose never to freeload, we have taken the beam out of our own eye. Once we have taken the option of freeloading off the table, we have eliminated the reason for others not to have faith in us. We are perfected in the eyes of God and indeed, by taking the pledge to not freeload, we have taken up our cross. We do not own anything we did not create and so we have no claim on anything we did not create. This is the necessary truth. It must be true or we could not live or function. People who freeload deny the necessary truth. As a consequence, they create our social problems. When we stop claiming what does not belong to us, we stop free riding, and we stop being a source of other people's problems, and this changes everything.